Okay, thank you. Well, if you'll remember, last week, at the beginning of chapter 21, Jesus had his triumphal entry. And from there, the cleansing of the temple. And then he was healing those who needed healing in the, in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes had become indignant at that. This week's message is called The Growing Controversy. And it's an extension of last week as the tensions were building. You'll see they're continuing to build as Jesus paints pictures of religious leaders who are trees without fruit and sons that are disobedient. I'll be reading out of chapter 21, verses 18 through 32. Now in the morning, when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, No longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, How did the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all these and all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching and said, But what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John was from what source, from heaven or from men? And they began reasoning among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say, from men, we fear the people, for they all regard John as a prophet. In answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. He also said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. The man came to the second and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of heaven before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. And you seeing this did not even feel remorse afterward so as to believe him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that it is to come together and hear your word preached. Lord, I I pray for our pastor as he preaches it, be with him. Lord, I pray for our congregation, both here and online, and, and even the first service, Lord. Just use this word to pierce our hearts, Lord. Illumine our minds as we hear it preached. Lord, I think of the the images you present before us, Lord, and, and the, the scribes and the Pharisees, Lord, I pray that, that we not be trees without fruit, but that, that those around us who are unbelieving and those, indeed, who are also believing would know us by our fruit. And I think of the example of the two sons, Lord, the one who, who at first refused but then did your work, and the one that at first accepted, but then did not do your work. I thank you that even though we came into this world refusing to do your work, that through the Holy Spirit, you do a work on our heart and allow us to do your work. And Lord, I thank you for the son that came before these two that not only promised to do your work, but accomplished it and did it perfectly, Lord. And it is in his name, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. The new arrangement of Low and the Gravy Lay, I liked a great deal. I probably would never want to sing it the other way again. Uh, 
however, there's one traditional thing I'd like for us to do this morning. That's the traditional Easter greeting. And even for those who are at home, I hope that you will respond. And I hope that you will respond heartily as I give you this greeting. He is risen. Amen. So Eric has read for us the scripture this morning, Matthew 21, verses 18 through 32. I'd like for you to look at your outline because what I'm going to say in the next few moments is directly from the outline. Uh, this section that we're looking at is going to conclude at chapter 22, verse 46. But what we're going to find in the, along the way, I might say, is a growing controversy. Uh, Mark handles this as, as if it were bookends. Uh, Jesus goes to the temple one day, curses the fig tree. They're returning the next day and they discover the fig tree is dead. Whereas Mel, Matthew kind of telescopes the entire event into one uh, pass where Jesus curses the fig tree and it dies immediately. So that's the difference between those two gospels. But there's a reason that Matthew does this as far as the Holy Spirit teaching us uh, what he would have us to see from the gospel of Matthew. Now, after this incident again you have an outline there and it goes like this so we have Jesus question which is the, the beginning of the section uh, at chapter 21 verse 24 we're looking at that this morning then there's going to be three parables we're going to look at one of those this morning three controversies and three uh, that we're going to look at and then Jesus question at the end of this section in verses 41 through 46 where Jesus asked them about David and if David was uh, his, in other words, if David's son was going to be the Messiah, then why did David call him Lord? How could that possibly be? And we'll cover that when we get there. But that just sets the context for the sermons that are upcoming. All of this content from Matthew points to the growing animosity of the Jewish leadership. And that Jesus, the, the truth about Jesus they reject this more and more as they go along. In the message this morning, we're going to begin with a section on the fig tree. Then we'll see the challenge of the Sanhedrin, which is represented by the chief priest and the elders, and then the parable of the two sons. So again, Mark's version of the fig tree wraps it around the cleansing of the temple and makes it a two-day event. But Matthew telescopes it into a single event and uses it to teach us two truths. Now, when you think about this, I want you to, to couple this, and this is the beauty of this entire passage, I want you to couple this with what we looked at last week. And that is, Jesus comes into Jerusalem. This, this is a visible parable. He comes riding on a donkey. And so we see the Messiah coming into Jerusalem. Jesus does this intentionally. His hour has come. The second action parable that we see is Jesus cleansing the temple. And so Jesus cleanses the temple. And again, this is a direct confrontation with the leadership of Israel. And now the third action parable is Jesus cursing the fig tree. So as they're coming into town, Jesus sees the tree. We're told here that it was a lone tree. And Mark tells us in his gospel that the tree was out of season. Figs usually bear in June. Occasionally at this time of the year there would be early green figs which were edible though not very tasty. And this is what uh, probably was happening. So you see this fig tree and if you know fig trees, fig trees are very leafy. They have large green leaves. A few years ago and I'm a highly trained professional when it comes to putting out chemicals. I've been to school. It's very important. I mean, it is ingrained in the farmers because if we don't do it right, we lose technologies that we need. So we have to try to do it right. Don't just think we use chemicals, harem, scare them. We don't. Very careful. But for some reason or other, after I filled out my 18 points on my sheet when I put out this particular chemical that day, something surprising happened to me and it happened to a friend of mine and I found that fig trees are very, very sensitive to this particular chemical. 
And I looked at this fig tree, and the leaves were beginning to cup. And I thought, huh, what's going on here? Then I thought about what my friend had told me, Stevie Yurdy, my childhood friend and great American. And those leaves kept getting tighter and tighter over the next few days. Then they turned white. Then they fell off, and all the little figs that were on the tree, that they weren't ripe, they all fell off too. And I'm like, this is not good. So I called the landowner, and this is the only farm that I farm on shares. So he buys half the chemicals, and I buy half the chemicals, and I said, guess what? We, meaning me and you, we defoliated your fig tree. I don't know if we killed it or not, but we at least knocked the leaves off of it. What's he going to say? <laughs> Now, if it had been somebody else, it could have went a lot further. But this was done with a chemical, and it took several days. Jesus looks at this tree, and he says to the tree, he curses the tree, you will never bear fruit again, and the leaves, if you could just imagine this in your mind, no matter, the, no one of the, the Disciples are amazed. The leaves fall from the tree. And I have good news for my story. The next year, the tree came back and made figs. So all I did was defoliate the tree. I didn't kill it. Jesus killed this tree. It, didn't simply, it wasn't simply defoliated. It withered. It was dead. It was dead. And the disciples... We're astonished. We'll see that in just a moment. So the first thing that we think about here in lesson number one is this. And, and, and here is a point that you have to get to, to get the next two stories. The green leaves on the tree represent, as Eric prayed, they represent religious works. They represent religiosity. They represent the Jewish leadership. They represent anyone who, who claims to be religious, who claims to have something, and maybe even sometimes they make a show of it, but their works demonstrate otherwise. So the point here is that the leaves represent the works, the religious works of the leadership of Israel. They have showiness, but no substance. There's no fruit. They're not doing what God designed for them to do. Now, to what respect does it apply to all of Israel? We'll probably talk about that tonight at the panel. Some commentators go back to several Old Testament allusions to this. I think the most relevant is Jeremiah chapter 24, verses 1 through 8, where God shows Jeremiah the two baskets of figs, and you might want to read this when you get home. And, and I think there certainly is some connection between this and that passage. But I don't think here that, that this is applying to all of Israel. I think it applies particularly to, again, the religious leaders of Israel because they are the ones who are known for their pious religious exercise and they're also the ones who have corrupted the temple. Jesus cleansed the temple in the, in the message that we saw last week in the previous passage. He cleansed the temple. Why? Because they had allowed it to become corrupt. So I think the best way to look at this is that it is a reference to Israel's leadership. Now think about this. Here are two good points that Carson makes here. First of all, the religious leadership of Israel rejects Jesus. I mean, they are rejecting him more and more and more. They, they have never accepted him, but they are becoming harder and harder and harder. But people from among the lame and the blind and lepers and prostitutes and tax collectors, sinners, 
are believing in Jesus. They're believing in him. They believe that he is the Messiah. That's why there's so much anticipation. The crowds believe, the crowds want to hear. As you watch the exchange here, the crowds seem to take delight in these exchanges between Jesus and the leaders of Israel. The second point is this. The disciples, again, are amazed. How, Jesus, how did you do this? So Jesus doesn't tell them how he did it. I mean, obviously he did it by divine power and divine prerogative. I defoliated a fig tree by accident and it took several days. Jesus killed this fig tree by speaking the word. And these men who have followed him for all these years, three years now, once again, they are just amazed. Are you amazed? I'm amazed. But Jesus doesn't go into that. What Jesus does is he takes their astonishment to teach them and turns it to teach them on prayer and faith. Now, this is not as it is so often misapplied and misinterpreted, this is not a carte blanche that if you pray and you, and you believe in something and you believe it enough and you pray for it, it's going to happen. That's not the point. If you look at the point of the story, if you look at context, which is so important, what's the context? The context is the unbelieving leaders of Israel and those who believe in Jesus. That's the context. Jesus is saying to these men, men, often I have told you that you are men of little faith, but now the hour has come. Now it is time for your faith to grow up. It is time now that your faith is going to, live, is going to move mountains. Now we know that he's not speaking literally here about the Mount of Olives. He is speaking figuratively, but their faith is going to move mountains of unbelief is going to move mountains of opposition. Believe, Jesus says, believe in me, believe in my mission, believe in the will of the Father, as we'll see this in a moment. You see, genuine faith in God's will requires discernment. And discernment comes through prayer and through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he exhorts them to believe in his mission and his purpose against the leadership who believe nothing positive about Jesus at all and thus they reject the full measure of his ministry and of his messiahship. That's important, guys. <clears throat> then we come to the next section, and that is the question. When he entered the temple, and there's a, a map here I want to show you uh, of the temple here and you can see on your right there's this large wall and you see I don't know if you can see it very well but I can see it without my reading glasses court of Gentiles that's when you when you come in on that side and there's where Jesus and that's where the disciples would talk and we, we see the disciples speaking on the portico well that large building on the end it has it has like a portico and people would get on the steps of the portico and they, would, and they would speak and they would talk and they would do oratories and they would have discussions. And so here's Jesus and Jesus, there's a, there's a visual picture I want you to get. Jesus has his 12 disciples. Now these men, they are not all in all out dedicated yet. We see when Jesus goes to Bethany in John 11 to raise Lazarus where... <coughs> The disciples say, you know, they told us if we come back to Jerusalem, they're going to kill us. And he says, I'm going. And Thomas says, well, I guess we'll go with him and die. These are not 12 zealots. These are not 12 bodyguards. I mean, when Jesus goes in, he doesn't have his entourage Of guys, you know, with their, with their bling and all the rest, you know, there to protect him. He's just got 12 guys who are wondering what in the world's going on here. And the only time they ever raise a hand, 
Peter raises his hand against Malchus in the garden when they come to arrest Jesus. Remember that? And that was half-hearted, and the rest of them are probably all, they might have already been running when Jesus restored the servants here. So Jesus is facing the full authority, the full representation of the power of the Jewish leadership and they're standing either to the side or in front of him as he's on the portico and you have what's represented in the story here and there's different groups of them that are going to come together and that's in your outline uh, chief priests and elders and you're going to have Sadducees and uh, you're going to have Pharisees and they're going to be teaming up with scribes and Herodians and all of these men they were factions because they didn't believe the same thing Kind of like denominations in a way. Fierce. Well, you don't believe, you don't believe in infant baptism? Well, no, we don't believe in infant baptism, you know. Well, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, and the Pharisees did. But the Sadducees were from the priestly class. And so they're running the temple, and they're the chiefs on the Sanhedrin. And these elders, these are guys from the civilian class, and they're on the Sanhedrin. And they're standing there, and they represent the force. They have the full force of the, of the temple guard behind them. They have the support of Pilate for the most part. And they're, they're here and they're asking Jesus this question. Here it is. They can't debate him theologically. They've tried. They've asked him questions about the law. They can't refute his ministry. They can't refute his doctrine. They can't refute his beliefs. So what are they going to do? They say... By what authority have you come? Who sent you? How dare you come into our temple and overthrow our money changers? How dare you come in here and threaten our system? Now, folks, this should amaze you. Jesus did all of this without any support. He didn't have armed people behind him. He didn't have the crowd ready to spring. Jesus did this by his own authority. If you don't believe in the Holy Spirit, you you haven't really thought this through because the only reason Jesus is standing there and not being attacked by these men physically is because of the Holy Spirit and because of Jesus' own air of authority. They looked at him and they knew he was something special and they hated him they hated him by what authority because they didn't believe he was Messiah they didn't believe he was sent from God and so Jesus used one of their own ploys on them a rabbinical method Jesus said I'll tell you what I'll answer your question here's a question for you the baptism of John verse 25 What was its source, from heaven or from men? Was John a real prophet sent from God or was John a false prophet? Now remember, these men lead Israel. These men teach in the temple. These men perform the temple rituals these men teach in the synagogues these men lead the villages these are the men who ought to know the truth these are the men who ought to be discerning the truth and how do they answer this question pragmatically pragmatically well If we say he's sent from God, then that opens up a really bad can of worms. Because not only would there be the fact then that we didn't support him, but if he were from God, then it's not only our embarrassment at stake, it's the fact that he pointed to Jesus as the Messiah. If he's sent from God, then Jesus is the Messiah. Can't go that way. But if we go the other way and we say what we really think, that he wasn't from God, then the people are going to maybe turn on us because 
They like John. They believe John was a prophet. So what are we going to say? The men who lead Israel, the men who are to stand for the truth, the men who say their truth comes from the Old Testament, these men say, we don't know. We don't know. Because they didn't have the backbone or the courage to answer. So Jesus said, well, if you don't know then, I'm not going to answer you. He turned away. And he said to the crowd, look at this in the next verse coming up in verse 28. He says to the crowd, what do you guys think? The very thing these men feared. Most, they feared the face of clay. They feared other people. They feared people's opinions. And Jesus feared nothing. Beloved, the resurrection is the most important thing in our belief because the resurrection validates everything else. Now, that's a fact. But what does it validate? It validates that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And when we see him standing here in the temple, what are we seeing? We are seeing with our own eyes the Son of God. The Son of God. He's standing there. It's amazing. He's standing there confronting them. He's standing there, a lone man against all the powers that be. Rome standing behind them for the moment. And he says, in your face, in his truth, they cannot refute. What do you think? Let me tell you a story. There were two men, or there there was a man, he had two sons. And he said to his first son, son, I want you to go out in the vineyard and work. And his son said, no way, dad. Got everything I need here. I'm going to stay home, play Nintendo today, and I just don't want to be hot and bothered. If you didn't want me to play Nintendo, you shouldn't have bought it for me. They still make Nintendo, I don't know. The other son, he says to him, will you go? Will you go and work in the vineyard? And he says, yeah, dad, I'll go. Absolutely. You can count on me, dad. But he doesn't go. But the one who said he wouldn't go, he got thinking about it. And he said, you know what? I'm going to go. And I'm going to serve my father. Now Jesus looks at them. Religious leaders haven't left yet. They're still there. They might be the ones who answered. Jesus says, which does the will of his father? And they said, the first. Oh, wow. You see, The point is, Jesus is turning this back on the religious leaders. And whether they answered or whether the people answered, the answer was obvious, wasn't it? But the answer indicts them. The answer damns them. Because they're the ones who say, we'll go. We're all about doing the Father's will. They got all the leaves, all the leaves. But there's no figs, no figs. The second guy, 
He doesn't have all the leaves, but he's got the figs. See the point? So Jesus says to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, they will get into the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, before you do. Talk about embarrassment. If this man is anything, if this man is anything, he has just embarrassed us no end. Because he says, the scum, the people that we think are scum are going to heaven, are accepted by God, and we are not. Jesus said, let me answer your question. You didn't believe in John the Baptist? And you don't believe in me. And that is your condemnation. You want to know why Jesus told the disciples to have faith? Because faith in the mission of Jesus, faith in the person of Jesus, is the only way to heaven is the only way to be accepted by God. In the resurrection, Jesus won the victory over death and hell, the grave, and for every believer, he is eternal life. For every believer. For all of you who will believe in him. Are you believing in him? He is life because he was resurrected, but first because he came and because he lived this life he lived and stood for the will of God and the purpose of God on my behalf, on your behalf. As believers. And I want to tell you something. When you look at this story, <clears throat> these three incidents, we'll call them different, that Matthew brings us, and you see the package that they come in, beloved, it should amaze you at the authority of Jesus, at who he was. His self-consciousness that he knew who he was. These men stood before him trying to intimidate him. The crowds were trying to manipulate him. But he knew exactly who he was and why he came. Not many people like that in the world, are there? And everybody's wondering who they are. Can I declare what pronoun I want to be? <laughs> Come on. That goes back to the fruit, beloved. You are or you aren't. Same as your birth, your spiritual birth, just like your physical birth, it's determinative. It makes you who you are. And this tells us that only by faith in Christ can anyone be accepted by the Father. Let's stand for prayer. Oh, Lord, we come this morning and we are truly, truly encouraged. As we see just days before the resurrection, we see Jesus standing there in his authority. These, these men who were not rubes, these men were well-educated, these men were powerful men, these men knew the ropes, and these men were trying desperately to deny the ministry of Jesus before they would destroy him. They wanted to deny him. They wanted to discredit him before they would destroy him. And they could not. And neither could they destroy him because on the third day he rose again. But we watch this and we are just in wonder 
at you, Lord Jesus, to who you are. So thankful, so worshipful about who you were and what you did and then what you did on the cross for us. You had lived a sinless life that we might be righteous and then you died on the cross that our sins might be paid for. And then you were resurrected on the third day to seal the victory and the life. Oh, what a great truth. May we never stand before anybody and say, we don't know, because we do know. We know your truth. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for making this truth come alive in our hearts so that even when we say these words, we're excited because we know They are true, and I pray this is true for every person in this building and every person who's watching and will watch. If not, Holy Spirit, I pray that you might awaken their hearts to the need to repent and believe in Jesus as their Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It has been wonderful to be with all of you today. I hope that you have a great Easter. And I would like to say this to you. If any of you are wondering or if you have questions about do I really know Christ? Uh, I'll be in the front afterwards. I, you can just give me a note and say, I'd like for you to call me. And I'll, I'll do that. And I'll call you. You can call me anytime during the week. I'll meet with you and tell you how you can know Christ as your Savior. And I hope you have a wonderful day. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.